Welcome to this week's episode of Two Guys and Some Horror. In this episode, I get to pick a movie that is pretty near and dear to my heart. It's not my favorite, but it's damn close. We're going to talk about The Lost Boys from 1987. Um, this film was directed by Joel Schumacher, um, and it stars possibly some of the highest 80s uh, celebrities in Corey Haim, Corey Feldman. They were teen heartthrobs but also a young Kiefer Sutherland, which I think is really cool as well. Um, joined this week on the show, as always, is my esteemed co-host, Clark. How you doing, buddy? I'm well, Michael. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on the show, Michael. You son of a gun. It has already begun. <laughs> <laughs> Throw out that fun fact and trivia while you're doing it. Come on. Hundred. Michael is the most used word in the movie. Uh, it said over 114 times. Over 114 times, um, which was no surprise to me when Clark mentioned that uh, during our pre-show notes. But to him, it was a little surprising that the movie was not named Michael. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I did say that. Uh, I absolutely love that. I think it's funny. Um, <laughs> and I can't wait to talk more about that in a little bit. But you've got the clap. Uh, yep. let's see <laughs> like, your messages to me sometimes in discord when we're, ch when we're doing the show are very distracting. And this one has thrown me for, a Oh man. Well, you said that. So I was like, Oh, <laughs> I did. I did. I always start right before we record with, okay, I'll get the clap and then we'll get started. So what I do is I clap very loudly. We give like a 10 second buffer and then we do the show open <laughs> and little man behind the curtain there. You got the clap. I so. got the clap <laughs> and we got started. There you go. All right, let's get back on track. So the story is pretty simple for this movie, actually. Um, after moving to a new town, these two brothers discover that the area is a haven for vampires. Uh, one of the brothers gets bit, or it doesn't get bit, but drinks the blood of uh, a head vampire, as they call it. Um, and the other brother, and Corey Haim, then tries to rescue his older brother from the vampire scene. Um the way I like to usually discuss the movies uh, without going plot point by plot point um, is to just kind of go through the characters, um, talk about them, find out who's your favorite, uh, and then also discuss some quotes. Um, but before we get too far down that road, is there a quick review from Clark? This is a fun vampire movie. It is. It is. Uh, which is oddly... I don't know. To me, that's that's a bit odd because Joel Schumacher is quoted saying that he wanted to make a sexy vampire movie, which, in my opinion, this does not come up in my mind when I think about The Lost Boys. I don't think I it's don't sexy. Know. Jason Patrick taking his shirt off. Ooh. Sure. Uh, sure. But <laughs> no, not in my mind. Not sexy. Um, he may have been sexy at the time. And he may have been a little bit of a sex appeal, um, but Jamie Jertz, or Gertz, depending on how you pronounce her name, is a lot sexier to me um, than Jason Patrick. But let's yeah. go Let's go through, um, I, I got a fun little story, uh, which also helps set the scene for where this film was shot. So the movie takes place in a city called Santa Clara, but... It was actually shot in Santa Cruz, uh, California, and the reason why they changed the name was because Santa Clara didn't want to be known for uh, the murder capital of, of the country again, um, since they had just gone through that issue actually back in the 70s when a serial killer took, took control of the, the city for a while. So they didn't want that stigma again, um, so they asked that they change the city name to Santa Cruz. My grandmother... Uh, when I graduated high school, took me on a trip down the coast of California, and one of our stops mm -hmm. was Santa Cruz. Um, so I've, I've actually been to the, the boardwalk and the pier <clears throat> that was used in the, the, some of the scenes for this film, specifically boardwalk and the beach scenes. Um, right. So that little dude, that Flintstones-looking character that's on that sky rise uh, what are those called? Like the ski lift seats as it's going around. Right. The uh, um, Ferris wheel? Uh, no, no, no. The ski lift. Uh, like you can oh. ride this ski lift thing 
um, over the top of the boardwalk to get from one end to the other without having to walk if you don't want to walk. Um, okay. I've actually ridden on that. Um, and the coaster that's there on the boardwalk I've also ridden on, which is pretty cool. Um, I, I'm a big fan of going to places where films have been shot. Um, I think it's it's kind of neat to go there and see the area yourself. Um, so any chance I get to, I, I try to, to do that for sure. Um, but yeah, so that's my little fun story about being um, to Santa Cruz where the, the boardwalk scenes and the beach scenes were filmed. Um, so let's go ahead and start breaking down um, more about the film and what our favorite moments were, which will get us into talking more about the scenes. Um, I mean, this is, to me, this is like nostalgia, childhood horror for Curtis. Um, if Scream is my, Scream is my favorite, The Lost Boys is definitely like probably my number two or number three. Um, but yeah, so who's your, who would you say is your favorite character in this movie? Grandpa, damn it. Why do we have the same character sometimes? Grandpa's the best character. Like, <laughs> let's just, he's, he's, he's a, he's a swinger. He's got a lady mm-hmm. and he's got the best line in the whole film, which the only thing I can't stomach Santa about Santa Cruz is course, all the goddamn all the vampires. vampires. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a toss up. So we're going, uh, favorite lines in the movie, uh, along with characters, so I definitely like Grandpa the best as well. Um, we're going to get into some fan theories about Grandpa. Well, you know what? Let's just crack that open right now. Um, so when he when he's dropping that line, it's right after he kills uh, the head vampire, which see how I didn't spoil anything there? I just said head vampire. You don't know who it is. That's that's some some good shit right there. So Grandpa oh, kills. You're spoiling that there's a head vampire. I already said that. Everyone knows that. Watch the trailer. You know that. So Grandpa kills the head vampire, pops open a Coke. There is a fan theory um, that Haim is even, Corey Haim has even kind of, not kind of, he quoted saying it, but Grandpa's actually, it's not just Coke in there. Grandpa's actually drinking blood from that Coke bottle. Now, how crazy would that have been if they actually would have made a sequel that well, followed that story? you don't drink anything from line? Grandpa's bin. That's one of the rules. Yeah, you don't touch old fart's shelf. Just saying, that fan theory right there would have been a, cool. To me, I was like, this guy's a vampire hunter. Because you see him in the sun. Mm-hmm. You see him outside. He's working in the in the sunlight. I don't think he's a vampire. If he is, he's immune to the sun. Well, I mean, so Michael goes out. He's a vampire. Yeah, but he's a half vampire. He's exactly. not drinking anyone. He has not killed anyone. So the fan so, theory... <clears throat> um, the one that so I saw written half, up is that, is that he's... Well, that he's half... He hasn't actually killed anyone. He's restrained, uh, similar to Star and Laddie, um, and that he hasn't actually converted fully to being a vampire. Um, now, none of this is actually confirmed by anyone in the movie. Um, so no Corys have said anything. Um, Schumacher right. hasn't said anything. This is more along the lines of... Yeah, th- I mean, you would... I don't know. <clears throat> if I was going to believe anybody, right, it'd be... One of the Corys or Schumacher himself, maybe right. even um, <laughs> Jason Patrick, if he wanted to talk about this movie, which he never seems to want to. Um, okay, cool. So, Grandpa, we both agree, best character uh, in the movie, in our opinion. Uh, your favorite quote, sounds like, is the goddamn blood-sucking vampire one, or uh, all the goddamn vampires. Is that correct? Yeah. My favorite line is actually Corey Haim. When he's talking about Michael being a vampire, which is my own brother, a goddamn shit-sucking vampire. Oh, you wait until mom finds out, buddy. That line to me, (laughs) it gets me every time. I love it. Makes me crack up. Uh, So to walk through this story a little bit deeper, that way we get uh, everyone understands what we're talking about. Basically, these two brothers are hanging out on the boardwalk uh, after they just moved to the new town. Their mother recently divorced. They move in with their grandfather. Uh, so they're all, they're hanging, Sam and Michael are hanging out on the boardwalk and they get split up. Uh, Sam decides to go to a comic book shop and meet, uh, the other, not main, but the other, um, I guess kind of, 
I guess they are main. The Frog Brothers are like main characters. Uh, so, so Sam meets the Frog Brothers, um, who introduce him to vampire comics. He says he's not into horror comics, yada, yada, yada. Um, but Michael meets Star. Star is this really beautiful young woman. Um, she is actually played by Jamie Jertz. Um, and who was it? One of the, I was listening to Joel Schumacher talk about this. Um, I believe one of the writers was adamant that they used her. He was trying to find a blonde, a young blonde for the role. But the writer, I believe, was adamant that it be this young girl because he'd seen her act and a couple other things and said that she was, she's perfect for the role. Um, so he was adamant on it, uh, yeah. which is why we get her. And I think she did a great job. I think she definitely played a beautiful, um, lustrous uh, vampire, half vampire woman. Star. Yeah. She's attractive. She's an attractive lady. Even in her 50s, she's still attractive. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I was just looking at her IMDb a little while ago, and I was like, yeah, she's still pretty attractive. So when Michael meets Star, um, that's how we get introduced to the actual Lost Boys in this film, which is David uh, and his gang. So David is played by Kiefer Sutherland. Um, you can already tell that there is some weird tension going on between David's character and uh, Michael's character. But before we get too far down this road, um, let's talk about some more things that are, that are kind of fun. So, um, see, I think the grandpa's best line is when they first show up to the house and <laughs> they're, they think the grandpa's dead, right? And he goes, mm -hmm. I'm pretending to be this. dead. And, and from the sounds of it, doing, doing a, a damn, damn good job. Good job of it too. Um, I think that's a great way to meet the grandpa. Um, but not that the other one's not a good line. I just, I tend to like this one a little bit more mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, but the Anything music, your grandpa says, the grandpa is probably, you know, one of the most. I'm trying to think of any other movies that might have come out in '87 that are horror. He might be the best horror character from '87. We'll have to do some digging. Uh, I will agree with you. I will agree with you. And I think either if he's Van Helsing or if he's a vampire, he's amazing. Why can't he be both? Day. Why can't it be a half vampire who actually turns to Van Helsing? I think that's a great theory let's, as well. Let's just uh, say one thing. Grandpa, for who he is, is a real hero and a real joy to be around. He enjoys marijuana, Coke, and Oreos. Yeah. Not necessarily in that order, but yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So that house, by the way, where the marijuana is, they actually that's a sound set that they built. Uh, at Warner yeah. Brothers Studio, um, and they and they, I mean, so so this film was shot in three weeks, mm -hmm. so they didn't have a lot of time, um, and the budget for the movie was eight and a half million, which sounds like a lot, but Shoemaker, Shoemaker constantly talks about not having a lot of time or money for this film. So for whatever he was planning on doing or whatever the costs were uh, with Warner Brothers, they couldn't. I mean, they didn't. They say they didn't have a lot of money, so. Um, that's super interesting to me. The fact that they, uh, that they feel like they didn't have a lot of money, but eight and a half million is a lot of money. Especially yeah. when you think about the movie we watched last week, Jaws in 1975 was made with a budget of 7 million. So this movie well, had, Jaws is also 12 years earlier. So it, this film had a smaller budget in terms of inflation than Jaws. Right. But this movie, I mean, there's not a lot to this movie, man. Um, you know, it's a bunch of kids bunch of young young actors and uh yeah a couple you gotta of rip off the hood of a car you gotta you gotta do all the destruction dude you gotta do the flying effects the you gotta flying do the, effects uh... were amazing so alex opinion. winter who plays marco um he's the the first vampire that gets staked mm -hmm. he his he had like hair extensions and his hair was bleached so you have to you have to include makeup and all that and then you have to include well, who was it? Whitney Houston or Tina Turner's saxophonist? Uh, yeah. So the sax guy is Timmy Capello. It's Tina Turner's sax guy. Hmm. Yeah. I, like it. I mean, let's talk Critics. about the music for the movie for a second. Um, okay. I really liked that uh, easy transition there. So this movie is on my playlist rotation. Um, this entire movie soundtrack. It gets played quite often uh, from my Spotify account. And um 
you know, it has it has some classics, uh, in my opinion, for for its time. Um, specifically, In Excess is on the album. Um, they recorded some songs that were for the movie, and then they got Echo and the Bunnymen to remake um, "People Are Strange" by The Doors, which I thought was really cool. Um, I really did like "People Are Strange." I liked a couple of the songs in this movie. Um, I did not like the, the some of it was kind of corny '80s music, but. Yeah. Yeah, I can agree I with it. you. Like, it has a pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like the uh, grooving <laughs> so that, that... <laughs> the Rascals kind of played. Yeah. I didn't like. Uh, I still believe. Don't let the sun go down on me. But you know, a lot of it was really good. Yeah, I think it's iconic '80s um, to the 100%. max. One hundred percent. Yeah, and I and I, I don't know. I think that's why I like it, uh, especially just because I'm a huge fan of the '80s. Um, I was born in 89, so I'm a 90s kid. Um, but the 80s, for some reason, is always what I kind of draw back to when it comes to um, film. And then a lot of music that I like is from the 80s. Um, yeah. But yeah, so this album is just, or the soundtrack is is a lot of fun. Um, speaking of The Lost Boys, so that's a reference to Peter Pan. Everyone knows that. Um, mm -hmm. If you don't, now you know. And I found it really um, ironic. They never grow old, right? They never grow you old. You know, I thought it, I thought it was because there was only one boy that was lost, and there was only one boy in a milk carton, and that's Laddie. Yeah, no. So I didn't even think direct, of that until you said it, but it yeah, makes sense. It's a direct reference to Peter Pan because they never grow old and they learn to fly, um, becoming vampires. But Ironically enough, there's only one line in this entire film that's direct. It's a direct reference of uh, the Peter Pan uh, play and animated film, which is, I told you, Lucy, my boys needed a mother. And that's Max when he's talking to her later on in the film. It's, uh, the, the, it's a very similar line to when Peter's talking with Wendy and the Lost Boys down in the little treehouse about right. how he needed Wendy to come be a mother to the kids, um, to the Lost Boys. So... I found that really funny that the movie's titled The Lost Boys. They don't really do a lot of, I would say, discussion um, specifically around the Peter Pan mythology that the writing is, is pulled from. Uh, but yeah, they, they still keep it, I don't know, kind of relevant and, and almost comedic. I mean, it is a comedy horror, so it's supposed to be comedic, but I think they do a really good job with that. Can we talk about Edward Herman? Uh, by the way, post he he has passed he did pass away in 2014, but he played Max mm -hmm. in every film he's in. He is just a complete nerd. Like why why is he always look like a nerd? So that's what I want to know. Shoemaker says or Schumacher says that he picked uh, him specifically to play Max because of his look, because of how. Um, caring he looks he wanted to build up this appearance around that character throughout the entire film so he makes him look vulnerable um there's the dinner scene where they try to accuse him of being a vampire uh and he passes the test so he's he's proven to not be a vampire at that point right um and and to schumacher's point he was trying he he specifically cast him because he wanted that kind of character who is uh, nerdy and sensitive and, and vulnerable and doesn't seem like he could be the bad guy. But yeah, so I, I think that's specifically I why to, he grabbed Edward Herman. I wanted to just kind of say that he he kind of has the look of of either a principal type cast character or like kind of like the Richie Rich's father. I think he did he play Richie Rich's dad in the Richie he Rich did. movie? He did. Uh, yeah, that's that's maybe maybe that's what I'm thinking. He He definitely looks like a like an investor or a stockbroker, but I, I did, I did really enjoy his performance in this film. I did not kind of some of the lore in this movie is a little off. Like, it, you, I'm not a vampire if you invite me into your home. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say it's off. I would say that's exactly what they were going for. Um, yeah. Specifically, when you invite a vampire into your home, you're rendering your yourself. Um, it's the right powerless. way to say it. Powerless to him, yeah. Um, and I think that's that's amazing. There's a couple I think other. They're the ones. They're references. the ones that made this that that up, though. I feel. I think this is the movie that introduced that. 
Sure. I don't know, but it fits. Um, they brought it back in with Buffy. They brought it back in with a lot of other uh, vampire movies. Yeah, well, so, and to Buffy's point, or to, to the other show's points, I mean, they may borrow that idea from here, right? But mm -hmm. Angel can still turn into a vampire, even when he's been invited into the home. Um, I don't I don't know how much power... I don't know what works and does what doesn't work, but right. they definitely took a lot um, of thought and and prep work into trying to figure out um, what they could and couldn't do once they've been invited so, in, which is kind of cool. I know this is a it's a little weird. Like, so garlic doesn't work, but holy water does. Yeah, um, they they cast out. Was yeah. there? Uh, a blunt object or or a pointy object through the heart garlic holy water uh there was the reflection they were trying to get that and then glowing the glowing part is probably my favorite so when the lights go out they're expecting him to glow right that was a little funny i, I did enjoy the frog brothers well think about where they're getting their information from right the kids yeah. kids are getting this information from a comic book yep so not everything's gonna probably be accurate, right? In I'm glad book. it wasn't. I would have been. It would have been so boring if that was the case. I mean, one thing that definitely is accurate from that comic book, which I find to be really cool, is uh, the Hellhounds. So when Sam and his mom yeah. go to deliver her apology, um, Sam's actually reading the part in the comic book about the Hellhounds, and then his mom gets attacked by Max's dog, which is what sets up this whole Max's the head vampire theory in Sam's head. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just thought that that was a really neat way of giving the viewers like, Oh, Hey, by the way, vampires have these hellhounds that protect them. And then all of a sudden, bam, Sam's mom's getting attacked. Right. Know, it's just, it was so perfect. It was, it was really well done. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the comic book store. Mm -hmm. So, when when Corey Haim goes and uh, Corey Haim's character Sam meets Corey Feldman's character and um, the other Frog Brothers character, um, I feel so bad because I feel like um, Jameson Newlander deserves a little bit more credit working with Corey Feldman. But uh, anyways, the Frog Brothers and Haim uh, meet for the first time. In the background, every time you see the Frog Brothers at the comic book store talking on the phone or or anything like that. Their parents. There's, there's the two hippies in the background. Yeah. <laughs> just stoned out of their mind, just yes. staring out in the distance. One of them looks like Chong from Cheech and Chong. Um, Dude, they're stoned. They are, they're totally. Just stoned. They're and stoned it's, with grandpa. And it's it's their parents. It is the I Frog Brothers' it. parents. Yeah. yeah. I, thought, I thought that was like a really great, subtle, they never say it, right? They never go, those are our parents or anything like that. Um, it's heavily implied, but after watching Corey Feldman and Corey Haim's commentary on the movie, um, they both confirmed it. They both said that that is their drunk, passed out hippie parents uh, of the Frog Brothers sitting in the back, which is so good. They're there to fight for uh, truth, justice, and the American, and the American way. way. Um, We're here to fight for truth, justice, and the American way. How much do you think we should charge them for this? About two fifty is what Corey Feldman says uh, when he answers his own question on the commentary track. <laughs> oh, man. The uh, the next scene that I like is the ceremony where they bring Michael mm. into the vampire brood. So David, at this point in the movie, you know David and his biker gang buddies um, mm -hmm. are all vampires. Um, you right. know that. You, you've got a heavy sense that something is not right with this gang. And um, they basically, they do the maggot scene. It's maggots, um, but it's really worms. rice. And then they do worms, but it's really just lo mein. And then they have him drink from the bottle which is blood, not wine. Uh, and that's all it takes. Drinking the blood of another vampire, obviously not doesn't just have to be a head vampire, can just be another vampire. But, yeah. So that's how Michael gets brought in to being a half vampire. But the scene where he's hanging from the train tracks has always just... I don't like heights, okay? And that scene always just wigs me out, man, every time I see it. Yeah. So like last week I was talking about how I'm not really scared of sharks in the water right because i don't live near water i don't deal with that but i have been to some very high places in my life and for some reason i'm not a fan of heights 
Um, okay. So this film has stuck around with me for a long time. Same. I, oh, man, it's just, it gets me. Huge, huge fear of heights, but I also love climbing high places. So I um, get it, but also... <laughs> I don't want to go climb high places. Probably the worst person to hang out with. with that. <laughs> uh, fun fact, though, about this scene is that it was actually filmed on a soundstage at Warner Brothers Studio. So they had to be super careful, Schumacher said, because when shooting the scene, you could actually see Magic Mountain behind them while they were filming. So they had to be very careful about the angles that they took. Um and and yeah, so he he just he laughs about that on the on uh, one of the commentary tracks, which is which is quite cool to to hear. Um, this horror movie not only features one dog, not only two, two. dogs, but there's Wait. actually three dogs used in the making of this film. Really, and not so a there's... single one dies. See, horror movies can have dogs, and the dogs not die. That's all I'm saying. <clears throat> And the dog gets a kill. Come on now. So you're like, what do you mean three? There's a nook, and there's Max's dog, the Hellhound. Where's the third dog, right? The nook was my favorite. Big, big fan of Samoyed and Huskies. So, yeah. So it was a Malamute. Was an it a Alaskan? Malamute? Yeah, that's what Corey Haim says. So it was an Probably. Alaskan Malamute. Was one, but an uh, nook actually had two dogs used for him. One was for the sweet scenes, and one was for the action scenes. Um, so there was actually two dogs that they were using uh, for those different scenes. Because, And the reason for this, their explanation at least, was that they didn't want like one of those dogs to get angry and bite an actor during a nice scene after it had just done an action scene possibly the day before. right? So that's why they kind of kept them separated and didn't have them do both types of scenes. Which is pretty interesting from a... Right. Uh, director standpoint it's a pretty smart move but my favorite uh scene with the dog though is when he pushes uh one of the vampires was it brooke mccarter into the holy water <laughs> into the holy water yeah uh he actually he actually yeah. saved the frog brothers um yeah who, who are wanting to charge and they're the reason why that house is so messed up because that's when the plumbing goes crazy the blood comes yeah, out no, of all the i pipes. agree <laughs> Frog Brothers basically did nothing. <laughs> no, it was they... Sam and uh, and Michael as well as the dog that that did most of the work. Yeah, Grandpa's um, the real hero, though. He's the real honest. hero. We're getting there. We're getting there. Um, so Fang Fangoria came. Uh, Fangoria, the the news or the magazine, uh, they actually mm -hmm. came down to the set because um, they wanted to see the makeup that they were using for Brooke McCarter during that scene. Fangoria. Uh, uh huh. The famous horror. Gloria? It's a horror magazine. Um, they okay. cover anything and everything horror related. Um, they have a really sweet website as well that you should check out um, because that's where I get a lot of my information on what's coming out soon. Um, but yeah, so they want to come check out the makeup being used for Brooke McCarter scene. Um, and it actually won best makeup effects in a horror movie at that time. So I'm doing something a little different this week uh, with the fun facts and trivia. I'm kind of giving it throughout our explanation. Um, so if that's if it's different and you guys don't like it, let me know. Let us know. Uh, so that way I can I can change it back to our old format. But I, I thought it would be a little bit more fun to uh, kind of just give you guys the facts as we're talking about the scenes. Oh, that's um, fun. What do you think of the death by stereo scene? <laughs> the death by stereo was goofy. Right? Dairy. Well, they even said it. Death by Dairy. You miss, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> I won't miss this time. Death by Stereo. Yep. Uh, it's, a little, so, uh, it's a little 80s ham. A little, uh, you got to put in some corny lines here and there. I love that you just said it's a little 80s ham because Corey Haim and Feldman, both in the commentary track, talked about how. Uh, Corey Haim was so excited to say that line because, because he was just like, yeah, this is the coolest line. It's going to go down in history. Death by stereo. Um, but in all reality, it actually is one of the most cheesiest lines probably in horror and uh, nobody remembers it. That's so back when everybody had a corny line though. Yeah. So it just got, it's another one in the bucket, right? It's just, 
it is it exists um so the guy who got shot there billy uh, with the arrow into the stereo was actually a stunt guy they they didn't even swap it out or try and make it look different um just because of the fact that the stunt guy looks so much like billy so do you remember the scene uh it's right before this but the vampire comes flying through the fireplace mm -hmm. so right there that's the stunt man then they cut sure. uh, away when they come back. It's actually the actor who plays Billy. Um, and then when they go to do the, the arrow scene, whoop, they swap him out again. Stuntman goes back in. And they didn't even try to like cut and change it back to being the original actor because those two dudes just look so similar. And uh, Corey Haim, is, he's, just, he's always in awe because he's like, you, can really, you can't tell the two apart. It's just so hard. Um, they almost lost all of the lost boys, by the way, in the making of this film. Um, it almost really? just ended up being like David and two other dudes, Alex Winter and one other guy, um, just because they didn't have a lot of money. And this is something, like I said before, that Schumacher just kept repeating, um, throughout the, <laughs> the commentary a lot is just, they didn't have a lot of money. And because he chose to use, um, B list actors or actors who hadn't really hit, um, you know, like a high notoriety level yet. Like this is the Corey's first movie together. And we'll get a little bit more into that later, but because he chose to do that, Warner brothers didn't give him a lot of extra money. In fact, they took money away from the budget, um, initial budget because they're like, well, if you're not going to use big name people, we're just not going to pay them big name money. You know? Jeez. Yep. That's a little goofy. That's the business. Oh, hey, you're just this young, struggling actor. We're not going to pay you the, you know, the half a million dollars like, I don't know, Leonardo DiCaprio's getting right now because he's so, you know, he's so well known. Instead, you're going to get like 50 grand for this. How's that sound? Still good? You still want to do the movie, right? You still want a movie? <laughs> which is, which you is find also the right cool. person for the part. Generally, they get paid a little bit less, but. Once the, the way Hollywood works is once they start getting that renown and well fact well known factor, they get more and more. So right. that's part of the game. I'm surprised Alex Winters was. Uh, he I'm pretty sure he didn't get paid a lot. He wasn't that big of a he wasn't that big of a name back then either. He didn't become a big name until he started doing the idiot box, and even then. I was gonna hmm. say so the way they made it sound about Alex Winter was that he was just like a gem that they you know that they found um basically yeah. a nobody at the time um you know and then schumacher just talks about how awesome he's become he you know he's gone yeah. on to be he went on to do um the movie with john wick uh right he was in death wish three well and then i uh, think they talk first film they talk a lot about his directorials as well because he went on to be yes. a pretty good director yes he is uh, a director now yeah. But mostly cartoons, mostly documentaries, TV movies. That's so cool. Um, yeah, the idiot box, though. We'll, 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 we're going to watch uh, another movie that where a studio gave millions of dollars to Alex Winters, and it just flopped. And we'll talk about that later. Oh, but man. I'm a big fan of Alex Winters. Nice. In general. And the, the name of the movie that I butchered. Um, fans are probably yelling at me right now like ah, Bill and Ted's yep I'm sorry Bill and Ted's excellent adventure yeah and then bogus journey and upcoming Bill and Ted face the music which is in post-production so that's actually quite exciting yeah no I that's been coming out for a long time nice all right so to kind of wrap this up, so basically you, you know, we, we had these two brothers. One ends up becoming a half vampire. The only real way for him to become a full vampire is for him to actually feed on somebody. Um, the girl that he met at the beginning of the movie, Star, and the little boy that hangs around her, Laddie, um, are also both half vampires. And you learn about this throughout the film. They, they have not fee, uh, fed on anyone either. Um, and they don't want to. They don't want to become vampires. They didn't realize that was what was happening. So they concoct this plan right to fight these vampires and that's basically what we were talking about with the do the dog killing the the vampire in the tub um and then the death by stereo this is basically that home alone moment where they're protecting their house um and and at the end of it 
uh, Michael and David have this really awesome battle. Um, so Kiefer Sutherland uh, and Jason Patrick fight to the death. Uh, and is it David ends up getting hooked on horns, right? I believe the antlers of one of the uh, heads that the grandpa is hanging in the living room. Right. And he ends right. up... One of his many, many uh, animals that he has uh, taxidermized, which to his, what the grandpa said is taxidermy is an art. And he keeps bringing... I love that he keeps the bringing Corey different uh, animals that he's performed taxidermy the closet. on. Yeah. <laughs> Corey just keeps throwing them in the closet. Taxidermy just animals? full of them. Oh, man. He's like, stop bringing me the shit, grandpa. Um he doesn't actually say that, but you could you get that you get that feeling from it. But um, but yeah, so each vampire goes out in a different way, right? When it dies, when it bites it, and they and the Frog Brothers are trying to explain this. Um, now remember, they haven't killed a vampire up until uh, they killed Alex Winter's character the day prior or earlier in that day. It's probably same day. Um, so they don't really actually know that. This is still all comic book information, but it's pretty damn accurate because. They staked one, and the blood spurts out all over them, and that's how it dies. And then they put one in water, and it dies in a most horrific, sludgy, sludgy way. And then one gets uh, shot with an arrow into a stereo and bites it in a giant explosion. And then when David dies, and this is probably the most, I don't know, like, sad death in the movie... It's just like this white light above David and then like this slow sadness or sorrow kind of drapes over his face as he dies and then that's it. Nothing like super exciting with David happens. Um, which death is your favorite, Clark? That would have to be when Alex Winter's character, Marcos, dies. He's the first one to get staked when they're in the cave mm -hmm. and then just water and juice just squirts all over everyone. And it's super, super hammy and over the top. And you just start <laughs> screaming and everybody else starts screaming. And they all start running out. And at that point, Dude, the they vampires are now buckets. on the trail of the boys. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It was ridiculous. It was all gooey and watery. So they actually made the, the blood sparkly as well. They put glitter in it mm. just Did to make know it that. different. Yeah. And Corey, both Corys are quoted to talk about the blood and how it was like a goop um, mm. in water. So it was like this two two different consistencies combined in buckets as they were just feeding it through these hoses that were tied up through Alex Winter's body and then just dumping down on them. And Schumacher just kept yelling at them, no, 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 stand under it. Stand under it because <laughs> they just kept wanting to move away from the the sludge um, I think my favorite kill is the Nanook kill when the dog gets uh, One of the dudes upstairs in the in the bathtub. That was definitely I think my favorite vampire kill um, But yeah, so so David dies and Michael star and laddie are still Vampires half vampires. They don't nothing's changed. They don't feel any different uh, and then the mom shows up with Max and the mom is talking with Sam and Sam's trying to calm her down and explain what's going on. But Max kind of just wanders over and looks at David and you see that he recognizes David. Um, and this is where you actually find out that Max is the head vampire. The boys were mm -hmm. right. Sam was right. He nailed it. Um, but because Michael, you know, Sam and the Frog Brothers didn't know this, but because Michael right. invited him in, all of his powers were actually um, hidden to the boys. So here we find out, and this is where Max and uh, good old Michael have a battle. Um, but Max is winning, pretty much. Max is going to kill uh, Sam if the mom doesn't come over and and become <laughs> one of them. And, uh, yeah, that's where we get the Peter Pan reference as well. And then Grandpa busts in and uh, ends up killing Max. And that's that's really the hero of this this movie. That's actually who saves the day. Uh, <laughs> and I think Clark would agree with me 100% on that. Mm. Yeah, of course. 
Yeah. Yeah. Of course, mon ami. Where would I do otherwise? Wunderbar. Um. Oh God, no, <laughs> no. Wunderbar. Uh, uh, <laughs> you do it so well, though. Um, and that's the movie. I I really like this movie, Clark. I know Clark likes this movie. Um, there's nothing bad to. To, I could really say about this movie, um, but I got I got a little bit more to talk about. Well, I actually really own I own the sequel to this movie, The Tribe. The Tribe, where uh, Haim comes back, Corey Haim comes back. He I, you know, I'm surprised they made a sequel because this movie does not need a sequel. It doesn't. Fact, it really doesn't. It should not have had. Do they talk about Grandpa at all in the sequel? Nope. It's all about Feldman. It's all about Corey Feldman's yeah. character, one of the Frog Brothers. So basically, really? yeah, the sequel's Hames about. In it, though. He's not though. I'll explain. He's so, not. I thought he was. It's an end credit scene. It's not. It's not really anything. But I'll get there. I'll get there. Let me sum up to okay. the sequel real quick, so that way people never have to watch this. Right. So the movie opens with Tom Savini. It's the only reason why I own the fucking movie. Mm-hmm. Tom Savini's in the opening scene, who is a vampire, and he goes and he goes to fight uh, uh, these surfers that roll up on his on his beach property. Right. The surfers are actually vampires. So now here's our new Lost Boys. It's uh, and I believe here's the crazy part. Uh, and I'm double checking this because I didn't check uh, just just before the show. But um, the main character, um, uh, it's the Lost Boys, the Tribe. Um, it's Angus Sutherland pay, plays the main vampire guy, um, and I'm trying to find out if he is actually the son of Kiefer. Sutherland or somehow related to them, but I don't I don't actually see it here. Angus was born blah as Angus Redford Sutherland. He is an actor and producer known for November Criminals, blah blah blah. He doesn't look anything like Kiefer. He doesn't. And he, he doesn't, doesn't look, look anything like Donald like... or Kiefer. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's think just purely is. coincidence. He's the son of Donald Sutherland, so he's Kiefer Sutherland's half brother. There you go. Yeah, so So he is a part of the family. <clears throat> Ironically yeah, so enough, Donald Sutherland, though, born in 1982, Donald has gotten around. Has gotten around? <laughs> oh, yeah. Of course. Of course. Donald, the best of the Sutherlands, but we can talk about Donald in another movie when we do, what is it, the pod people? Uh, invasion of the Body the Snatchers? Body Snatchers, yes. Yes. Body Snatchers. Which we definitely have to get on the list. So don't watch and The we... Tribe, I guess, is my biggest thing. Don't watch The Tribe. But it's about. I won't completely different characters this brother and his sister move into this town um and they run across Kiefer sutherland's half brother who is the leader of the vampires in this one and oh. uh the sister gets turned not the brother um mm-hmm. and then feldman shows up interesting to reprise his role as one of the frog brothers and uh yeah end of the day they win they kill the vampires blah 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 but the end credits have, and this is why it's, I think, important for fans of The Lost Boys. It has some closure for us, but not really. Because the end credits has Hain come back, and he's he's in the end credits as a vampire. He's actually a vampire. And it shows uh, Corey Feldman's character running at Corey Haim. Corey Haim <laughs> running at Corey Feldman. And they're basically going to have this really big fight, and nothing really comes of it. That's it. You go Just back to the credits. Cliffhanger. Yep. Which we then get uh, no, a I'm third good. film in the trilogy of the Lost Boys that doesn't need a sequel or a trilogy called The Thirst. Okay. And we're just not going to talk about it. We're going to pretend like it doesn't exist because the sequel shouldn't exist. And we're going to move on. I'm, I'm actually adding the tribe to our list right now. <laughs> That's totally fine. Um, we're, We'll do the third. The Thirst? Yeah. The, the Thirst? thirst? Yep. Oh my no, Corey yeah. Feldman, stop being in movies. It's just yeah, and it's I'm pretty sure the that movie was only made because of him. I really like doing this voice and talking <laughs> like like I'm a bad guy. Corey Haim makes fun of Corey Feldman's voice so much in the commentary. <laughs> it's so good. Dude, I honestly he was he was hamming it up. Well he wanted to be is coming Sylvester out too. He can Stallone, be in that. Mouth the is coming back, Goonies two is in I don't know. Is it pre, post, whatever? Goonies two is coming out. We're getting all these sequels to movies made in the eighties. 
we'll, we're fine. We get all the Corey Feldman we need. I don't need any more Corey Feldman trying to be a badass. I don't. I don't know if the world really needs much more Corey Feldman. He just needs I like, to get better. I like Corey Feldman as kind of the weird outcast character, and he does that very well. Um, like as is it when he was the mouth in the Goonies? Great. When he was uh, the the weird kid in Stand by Me? Great. Mm-hmm. But yeah. So what about when he was in Friday the Thirteenth? Honestly, don't remember him that much. I remember he was Tommy Jarbles, but I don't think he did much. Yeah. I don't think I finished the third one. I so to be so, bluntly honest. I think I finished the second one and then when I was watching the third one I kinda just got bored and stopped. So he's in Friday the thirteenth, the final chapter, which I believe is four. I okay, believe. so that's where I didn't I didn't get to. I, I finished the third one. Let's see. Yeah, part two. So I know a lot of people are probably going to be listening. They'll be like, Part what three. Clark doesn't like the Friday the 13th franchise? And no, that's not the case. That I is not the case. Got, I yeah. just got burnt out after the third one. Yeah. I mean, Jason, listen. Uh, Jason X was kind of it. For <laughs> no. <laughs> when you've seen me, the worst like, one, all the others are better, though. No, I'm going to have to admit, like, I liked the, the last one better than the original. The last that, one. That sleeping bag thing just made that movie for me. Wait, the remake? Anyhow, back Sorry. on topic. Wait, the remake or Jason X? I need to understand. Jason X. No, I have the... not seen the remake. Okay, the last one's the remake, and I, I just... The, or, the original film. Okay. Um, I did not like very much, and I, I told you about that. Yeah. But... And we'll get... We'll, we'll talk more about that in a future episode, for sure. Yeah. Guarantee let's... it. Yeah. But yeah, so it's... you're you're Tommy Jarbles. Uh, Tommy he's Jarvis actually the returned. hero. Yeah, he's the hero of that one. Okay, so back to the Lost Boys. So there is a third. We don't talk about it. You're apparently adding the tribe to the list. That's amazing. We'll get there eventually. Um, <laughs> Hope not. I'm not too excited about it, but that's fine. You sound very angry. <laughs> uh, well, because I just don't watched watch it today. Movie. I just I'm watched it today. To the list, you jerk. <laughs> I own it on DVD because Tom oh. Savini's in it. Um, coming over uh what oh, was his name perfect. in uh dust till dawn sex machine mm, sex, sex machine. machine all right so i'm going to leave you with this little bit of uh, uh directorial fun fact and trivia okay mm. so in the scene where the maggots are the rice and the worms are the low main um, mm -hmm. maggots don't move for no reason so in fact if you put a bunch of magnet uh, maggots in a uh chinese food container they would just sit there and be still so there's actually a trick to get them to move and the trick is you use lemon you squirt lemon on them and they will actually start to move and that's how they got them to move for the scene did that kill them nope it just okay. annoys the shit out of them good yep maggots are gross i was told no maggots or worms were harmed in the making of this film <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. They had uh they actually paid two guys. This is where all the budget went. They paid two guys to help wrangle and take care of the worms and the maggots. <laughs> oh my god. So good. Anyways, I love, it. I love this film. Uh if you've never seen it, see it. Don't waste your time listening to me talk about it. Go see it. Uh then then listen to me talk about it. Clark, what's your I don't know, scale review? What do you got? My Gale, you want me to like number this movie? What you, yeah. What do you think? If you, if you, I, if you so this, kind. this is an '80s movie, dude. This is like an '80s teenager movie. I honestly, I know a lot of people love it, and to me, it's okay. I'm okay with it. It Perfect. lives here with me, and I will watch it and I will enjoy it. But without Grandpa being the main character, I feel that this movie hasn't reached its full potential. All righty. We will move now into what have you been up to lately? Oh yeah, that's a good that's a good question. What have you been up to lately? I have been uh so video games aside, I'm gonna put those aside for a while because I don't know if our audience fits in that category as like extreme nerdhood like I do. Um I've I've been cooking a lot like a lot lately because I have to and I've been really enjoying it. I've been kind of pick, picking new flavors, new thing, things and I've you know, chopped up a couple bell peppers and made some got some well marbled steak. Made sure I had some really good ingredients. 
made some amazing eggs, super creamy. Just made some really good breakfast burritos, and that's that's kind of my day right now. Investigating flavors, taking myself to Flavor Town. Guy Fieri has yet to come over though. I mean, eventually, you just got to turn your place into a diner, drive-in, or a dive, and you're good. Well, my house is kind of divey. I think you're on your <laughs> you're on your way then. I'm on my way. How about on yourself, bud? Way. You know what? Um, honestly, so last week I, I had already read that book and finished it um, halfway. Quick plug for that again. Halfway on Amazon. Yeah. Check it out. Our good friend Cindy wrote it. I haven't started it. it yet because this we just recorded after <laughs> after the Jaws episode. Damn it, man but, behind the curtain. Um, you know what? So it, It's right, got to happen. Right I'm now, read it. I, right now, I'm just I'm really uh, anticipating my child being born here soon. So, yeah, this episode comes out uh, the day after my birthday, actually, um, and I turned thirty. I turned thirty one yesterday. If all goes appropriate mm. to our schedule, yeah. Uh, so everybody, so... <laughs> make sure to say happy birthday to Curtis if you haven't already. Uh, um, and yeah, humus birthday. So I'll have a baby by the time. Uh, another baby by the time everyone's listening to this. So I have a six year old and then I'll have a newborn. Um, yeah. And I think right now I'm just anticipating that and, uh, you know, prepping and planning as much as I can for it. Cause it's going to be crazy for a little while. Uh, baby. I'm really excited easy. for you, man. Thanks dude. Can't wait. It's going to be a lot of fun. A lot of fun. You're going to do great. Dad of two. A little baby boy. Alrighty. Well, I'll plug our social media here, and then we'll bid you all adieu. So you can follow us on Instagram or Twitter at the number two guys horror pod. You can also email us at two, the word, guys and some horror at gmail.com. Uh, feel free to reach out to us anytime you guys need anything. Uh, if you want to make suggestions for what we should watch, uh, we would really appreciate, appreciate that as well. And yeah. I look forward to talking to you guys next month, July kickoff. I can't wait. We've got a doozy oh, yeah. planned. Mm. Mm. July is going to be great. This summer. This summer. I could finally start using that voice again. Mm. Mm. June. June episodes. All right, guys. Thank you for listening to us. We love you very much. Adieu. Adieu. Mon ami. Thank <laughs> you.